Hello, I'm Leanne Sanderson, and this is Hope United, Everyone's Game with EE and Gay Times. A show where I'm joined by a select panel of former players and fans to discuss homophobia in football. I'm joined by this amazing panel to the left of me, none other than Joe Cole, former West Ham, Chelsea and England international. Farrah Williams, the most capped player of all time for England. Cole Fern from the Gay Gooners and Chris Porras from the Proud Lily Whites. Thanks, guys, for coming along today and for having this amazing discussion. You addressed her as a friend of yours. Am I not a friend of yours as well? Kind of. Okay. Wait, I don't know, sometimes. <laughs> guys, we've got a lot to get through, and I want to start with this question. Where do we see society in the next 10 years and its attitudes towards people of different sexualities being more openly involved and watching and playing the game? There were 106 reported incidents of hate crime involving sexual orientation at matches in England and Wales during the 2021-22 season. A massive 186% increase on 2018 and 19. The last full season unaffected by the COVID-19 pandemic when there were 37 such incidences reported. All right, guys, we've got a lot of really important topics to get through today. So, Farah, I'll ask you the same question. Where do you think you see society within the game growing the next 10 years? But my honest answer is I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I certainly think if I look back 10 years and where we were 10 years ago in terms of these type of conversations, we probably wouldn't have a male representative from the men's game actually on a panel open to discuss and hear and be educated. So I think the fact that we now have yourself, Joe, that is, you know, being educated around the LGBTQ plus community, myself, that's now open to talk about these topics. I think we've already made strides. So I think the more open people are to, to talk and discuss and see where they can move the game, the better it will be. So you think 10 years on from, from here, how much more improved this can be? Allowing them to be more accepting and be more educated, I think that's the easy part. I think the difficult part now is that where we take these conversations and really make change within stadiums. Where do you think, you know, we see the game evolving in the next 10 years within society? Football's always been a catalyst for anything, any kind of social change, because it is the people's game. I think it's great that we're, we're, we're starting conversations, we're highlighting issues, not just, you know, on homophobia, you, you know, racism, equality, all of these types of things through football, I think it just starts the conversation. I was blessed to have a long, long career and I met all types of different people from different cultures, different backgrounds, and you learn more. I think to myself, if I weren't a footballer, I didn't have that opportunity to meet different people in different walks of life, I, would have, I, I wouldn't be the person I am today. You know, like being open and, and just as well-rounded as I am. So I'm very lucky to do that. So when, you know, you get asked to do campaigns like this, you think, you know, maybe I, I could maybe I could add a little something to it. With regards to the fans and what Tottenham are doing and what Arsenal are doing, how far do you think we have come? I know there's still a lot of work to do. We're in 2023, but how far do you think? Because the Gay Gooners just celebrated 10 years, and how far do you think we've come in that time? Oh, we've come tremendously far, uh, and amazing what we have done together with Arsenal. The amount of work that went on behind the scenes, getting acceptance from the club to take yeah. this forward. I think that was very, very important. And that, that's part of the trailblazing that we're proud of because now I think just about every uh, club in the, in the Premier League has got an LGBT uh, plus group. Who would have thought that 10 years ago, that we'd have had these groups and Chris and I would be sat here together on a show like this with, with, with Joe and Farah. So from that perspective, we've come a long way. Um, and on the 10th anniversary of the, the Gay Gooners in February this year, the club really did do us proud, and that was genuine as well. We were at the game together. We were we at were, the Brentford yeah. game, absolutely. And everything you saw that day that the club put on literally was from the heart, from the club. It wasn't mm. a tick-box corporate exercise. I've never felt that about, um, about Arsenal. So that was a, a great day. And then I'm often asked, well, what about the next 10 years? Yeah. And the real answer is we shouldn't exist as a group. Do you feel then that you have to sit together to feel accepted within a football stadium? At the Emirates, no, we don't. We don't sit as a group. And we've of the 1,500 members we've got globally, over 100 are season ticket holders. On the other hand, at an away game, um, we get away tickets just like other uh, members. We don't get any special rights in terms of number of tickets. But when we do get tickets, the club put us together right. as a group. And I personally think that's, that's important. Uh, especially at an away game. I mean, we've all experienced away games. You know that the atmosphere in the away end is very different from, uh, from, from the main stadium. What, what do you do, though? Like, Chris, I want to ask you this question, because obviously we talk a lot about the condemnation of the Rent Boys chant, and this will be offensive to a lot of people, and everybody it should be offensive towards. And I think every single week we saw another one come out today, you know, saying they heard it at the games. What can people do? 
Because I think this whole point of like, you know, things being taken as banter, that's never banter. To me, mm. to Joe, who's a straight male, it should never be banter, should it? So what can people do in that situation? Because you can't stop everybody from saying that in a stadium at that moment. You can't say, you stop, you stop, you stop. So what, what do you do, Chris, in that situation? Well, I, I think... The important thing to remember is, is that up until a year ago, that particular chant was not deemed as homophobic. Us as fans got together and we gathered um, nearly 100 statements from LGBTQ plus fans to, to say why that chant was homophobic. Mm -hmm. Because we spent half our time arguing about why it was homophobic. And you know what? It's not necessarily even about offence for me, Leanne. I think the important thing there is like, it's not about you offending me. It's like, what's unacceptable? And it was clear that was unacceptable. It was harmful. My co-chair, Lee, at the Proud Lily Whites, he didn't go to football for nearly 10 years because of that chant. He was bullied with it in the school playground and the school bully got suspended, yet there he was, surrounded by people singing it. And he had to leave the game. He didn't get a chance to say goodbye to White Hart Lane. And that's, like, heartbreaking that that chant does that. So with Chelsea Pride, yeah. as much, again, with rivalries aside, um, with Chelsea Pride, we gathered these statements and we presented them with a bit of support from the FA in terms of who to really get to in the CPS and the UK Football Policing Unit. And that chant has now been reclassified as homophobic. Now, I don't want to criminalise anybody, but at least we now know we're not arguing about whether it's homophobic or not. And the FA have written a letter to all the clubs to say, look, this is a homophobic chant. It's now against the law. Yeah. And so you've got to do something if you've got mass chanting of this. And that's something that we've done as fans and something that's really important to make sure that we feel, as mu we feel like we belong in football as much as everybody else does. Here's another stat for you. The Home Office found that hate crime incidences reported in relation to 384 matches, 13% of all matches during the 21 to 22 season. How surprised are you all at the rise in this? I think it's, I think it's great. I welcome it because actually we know that report, those reports are just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm not, I don't think necessarily that there's a rise in instances, although it's probably a little bit of that as well. So do you feel like people are now more open to reporting, to reporting these instances? Yeah. So but, they've always been there? Yes, I think mm. they have always been there. But we also know that, you know, progress isn't linear. And so things go up and down. So if you look at um, hate crime against um, our community last year in... England and Wales, it was up by 42% for sexual orientation and 56% for trans hate crime. Now, that's not just football. So there is an increase as well. And I think what we've got in football is the ability for people to report it. And the even better thing is it's not just us. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's people who are, who've got LGBTQ plus people in their family or just actually just say, this isn't on because this isn't what we want in our football stadia. These types of platforms when people, you know, in the cold light of day, they're probably driving to work, listening to it on the radio and thinking, oh, I'm listening to Joe, I'm listening to the guys talk about this. And then that will then, they'll go into the head and then maybe they won't do it the next time. And then it gradually, I think it's a, it's a systemic problem, isn't it? I think it will just go, but to, but I think it's a very difficult situation you guys must be in to, to when it's actually happening. I found myself in a situation at the Carabao Cup final about four years ago. A guy next to me was using the F word, a derogatory word, towards a gay male on the pitch. He was saying it to me as if to say that was OK. Mm -hmm. When I went to report it to the steward, that person then knew it was me. So then what do you do in that? How do you navigate Imagine that situation? Imagine if you're a ticket holder as well. Yeah, because you're sitting next to the same people. The time. So yeah. I think that's what goes through people's minds because there are a lot of people this will resonate with. They'll want to speak out, but what do you do in that situation? I went and, to I went and told the steward and the sh they then knew it was me. So then what? <laughs> you always want people to be safe. So what I always say to our members is just as much as you can, take the the details, the, the row, the seat, et cetera, and report it. And then sometimes they'll come and deal with it at the time. Other times, depending on mm. what's going on, you've got cameras um, in the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. So there are different ways there. We last played um, Chelsea. I, someone was arrested, but also our members, four or five of them reported something and they heard from the club the following working day. And so they've all been followed up, those reports. So that's the other thing, is if you can see there's action, you'll yeah. do something. feel <laughs> physically threatened at games at all. Has there been incidents of that? I went all the way to Baku for the um, Europa League right. uh, final. Then I heard a chant, the Ashley Cole chant about his mobile phone. And there was about 12 lads sat around the bar saying this chant. So I got up to go 
And my friend said, don't go, don't say anything, don't say anything. I said, no, I'm a member of the Gay Gooners and I'm, you know, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm a member of this group for a reason. Yeah. We've got to try. So I went up and I was very polite and said, gentlemen, please, please, we have better chance. Yeah. Far better chance than this, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the Gay Gooners and I find, yeah. I find what you're chanting is offensive. Well, 11 of them were like, oh, mate, that's, we're really sorry, we didn't realise. Yeah. And, and all that stuff. One of them got out of his chair and literally tried to rip my throat out. Really? An Arsenal fan. Went absolutely, but said the worst kind of language mm. to me in front of everybody in this what bar. What did his mates do? Say again? What did his mates do? They, weren't, they were just people that had gathered. They weren't, oh, right. so okay. they, were, they were quite surprised and they literally had to be dragged off. Not surprised to say the least because we've seen football fans, we saw at the Euros, but on the flip side, you were able to educate people. And I think this is what it comes down yeah, to. I, you know, I, people are open to change, touching on what Joe said earlier, that, but it's more about education and also people being, it's okay for people to make mistakes. Do you know what I mean? You don't yes, want to live in a yes, world where yes. people don't feel like they can speak because they're scared of saying the wrong thing. Mm. And I think sometimes that's where we find ourselves at. And that's why these conversations are so important because someone might say something that someone might not like, but you can, you're open to learning. Mm, and mm. that's why I wanted to come to you, Joe, mm. Joe, and ask you if you've ever witnessed at a game, you know, homophobic <clears> abuse, <throat> whether you've been playing or whether you've been in the stands. Yeah, see, of course. You played for Chelsea. Yeah. You heard yeah. It every Chelsea I've game heard they the say chance, is. you know. Um, and obviously, because as a, you know, a straight man, it, it, just, it goes over your head. You don't think of it as offensive to... It wasn't offensive to me as Chelsea because, you know, just that's me. But n now you understand the gravity of it. And then people, you know, I've got, you know, in my family, you know, I'm around gay people. I understand it. I've, you know, I'm born in 1981. I'm not as old as I look. So, <laughs> um, um, you know, you understand it. But so you hear it on a day to day basis in football, you know. And again, I, I liken it to that story about, you know, 11, 11 fellas didn't realise they were doing it. But then you'll get one lunatic who's obviously got an issue. Mm. And that's the guy you can probably not get to, do you know? But them 11 oh, guys, you can, yeah. That, that, but how do you, how, that was going to be my question, how do you change that, right? These chants have been there for, for many of years, right? And you talk mm. about generations, we're going back and we, we assume it's the, the older mm. generation that's seen these. Especially. I've been at games where kids are chanting the same yeah. thing and they don't even understand <clears throat> what they're saying. They're mm. repeating what they heard. And that's, the, mm. that's their learning, right? So at football games, that's mm. their learning. I remember as a Chelsea fan, you go to the game, I used to sing all these songs because it was, the yeah. thing to do, right? You're yeah. a kid yeah. and you and want to sing along. And we spoke about this before, fans, about the playground at school. But you don't understand why you're doing it. Yeah. used to say things, everyone used to say certain things, but didn't realise mm. it doing. was offensive. Yeah. Mm. And just that's because it's not offensive to that. you, it doesn't mean to say it's not offensive to the next person, and that's yeah. the difficulty. But how do we then educate these people? Mm. Because the generations are going to knock on. These songs are still going to go yeah. 10 years down the line. These now 10-year-olds, when they're 20, are going to be singing yeah. and being the, the, the leaders and the drivers of these mm. songs that are, are sang in stadiums. But you said that earlier about how do you change a stadium. You talked about football being global, and I think there's something interesting in that. Because if you think about how many people you reach every single weekend yeah. and the, hearing that whether you're watching on the telly or listening on the radio that atmosphere in the stadium is the thing that kind of draws you in that kind of crackle yeah. that excitement so the thing there is, is that you can as you've just said about that that chant that you heard in, in Baku it's like there's loads of different chants and the, mm -hmm. and as we're doing this it's, it's it's a slow bit of behavioral change if you like but you do it by having you're using your global reach for good. I wanted to ask Farah about Stonewall FC, you know, they had to abandon their game based upon, they're an LGBTQ plus team, for those that don't know, that to abandon their game based upon the abuse they received. Do you feel like at the lower levels, there's enough being done to combat this type of stuff? Because obviously teams that are in the public eye, things that are in the public eye are being reported, but do you think it's enough is being done at the lower levels? Probably not. There's probably... I think it's an educational thing as well. It's a funding thing, it's money and where people want to invest their time and probably they don't probably think that it starts at the top. So if we start at the elite and try and get that right, it filters through. Well, actually, if we start at the grassroots and filter it up, it might, we get to a stage that when we're at senior football, it's normal. But we do it the opposite way around and that's probably where the struggle lies is that we start at the wrong point in, ter in terms of education and then, it, yeah, it has a knock-on effect. So, no, I'm probably not surprised it happens because there's probably not enough done down at the grassroots level to educate these people around that, and they can get away with it because, as you say, who, who do they report it to 
at those lower levels. Probably no one. harder to report at that Probably, I would, I would say so. There's probably no one there. There's probably not enough people because they don't have the platform. Mm. Mm. Maybe yeah, that's why. Not. It's not right, it's but maybe that's... Number. But you see, there's loads of things. Yeah. You think of, like, grassroots referees and stuff yeah. like that. There's so many people that, you know, they get bullied and abused. Yeah. And I mean, I was at a grassroots game the other day, the same thing, a young lad. Yeah. He's, like, he's petrified to walk from the pitch to, to probably the train station because yeah. he gives a decision that, you know, a parent don't agree with. Yeah. It's perfect, but the grassroots is where the funding and, and education should start yeah. because, you know, that's going to create a better society in years to come. And report it to the ref and then what happens? Mm. Get, that's yeah. the other thing. It's like, who mm. then gets to adjudicate on it? Any time an, an LGBTQ plus fan group pops up, you've got, you know, people saying all sorts of things. Where, where does the backlash come from? Oh, they want the, where's the straight? Where's the straight group? No, do you know that's, what you would get? A, yeah. Every single, <laughs> who, who, every who single time, every single time an LGBTQ plus fan group um, starts up, they always get, and I've literally heard this from about 15 clubs, yeah. I'm not joking, they always get an email from someone yeah. saying, what about a fan group for gingers? Someone thinks they're being right. funny. And it's just like, look, do you know, you know, and the club will yeah. always say, if you think that's something that you want to organise yeah. around, knock yourself out. Yeah. And, and exactly <laughs> as Carl strange. said, we said it from the start, from you can look back yeah. to 2014, we want, to put, uh, we want to put ourselves out of business. Yeah. That's literally our objective, yeah. is we don't want to be there anymore. But while we are, and that flags up and that says, football's for you two. Yeah, here, here. that's it. Yeah. All right. Definitely. In 2021, Adelaide United's Josh Cavello came out as gay, as the only, at that time, current footballer to do so. He is quoted saying, all I want to do is play football and be treated equally. And the power that this is this video and my coming out story has had on the on people around the world is just absolutely phenomenal. I was at the Adelaide United Awards night and I was lucky enough to win the Best Young Player Award. As I went on the stage and I saw, you know, my my brothers, my teammates, my my coaches, and that was my family because obviously I'm living away from home and Adelaide is my new home. It was just hard to be genuine, to be real and like to be in that moment and celebrate with them to know that that wasn't my true self. I had to act like I was happy on the outside, but on the inside, I was absolutely devastated because I was like, these people don't even know who I am. Like I spend 24 hours of a day with them and I'm lying to them. I'm showing them someone that's not me. It was a huge moment for myself and definitely one that um, I'm going to remember for the rest of my life when I came out to my teammates and my coaches. I walked into my coach's office and um, at the time, our assistant coach, Ross Aloisi, was there. And I was like, Ross, I'm going to be coming out for the true person I am. I'm going to be coming out as gay. And he kind of looked at me and said, is that it? And I was like, what do you mean? Is that it? And that instance, we both started laughing. And then the coach walked in the, ro in the room and we said the same thing. And he said, Josh, uh, you know, I have someone in my family that is in the LGBTQI space. And um, that's, I know how important it is and how significant it is. And I just want to give you a big hug and, and celebrate this moment with you because it's huge. And I'm, this is my gaffer saying that. So it was a huge moment for myself. And it just gave me the confidence. You know, I went and trained that day and I felt like there was 15 kilos of weight off my shoulders. And I had the best session, Adelaide United. It's like a family there. And I wanted to show the world that, you know, it's possible, you know, it's possible to come out in your team and everyone to be happy with you. You, you might get that one or two that isn't, isn't happy with you, but that's not your problem, that's their issue. So um, I think from my example, I've shown that there are teams out there like Adelaide United that is like a family. Yeah, and we've been friends for a while. Talk to me, what was your journey like for coming out? Was it hard? Because I know you're quite a, you know, you're an open book, you are you, but was it always that way? Yeah, I've always been. I think it's the family that I was raised in. You know, it was almost like we love you no matter what. Although my journey was quite different. And I feel like sometimes I've always tried to navigate who I really am because I grew up, I had a boyfriend. You know, I never felt like I was gay, if that even is a thing you feel like. Some people have different stories. And I think sometimes people have often tried to work me out. You know, I like to get my hair cut into a mohawk. Don't laugh because <laughs> I, know you, I know you love my hair. I get my nails done. And people are trying to put you into a box. Yeah. I feel like, and I'm not, I don't want to be put into a box. Yeah. I like to wear makeup, you know what I mean? But yeah. I am gay. So for me, I always felt like, and people that are gay wear makeup. It sounds really silly, yeah. but there's always this, like you have to be this butch lesbian or you have to be this person. You don't have to be anything. Yeah. I've always been unapo unapologetically myself. And I feel like that comes from my family because not everyone's that fortunate to have a family like mine where they're accepting of me. How was it in football though? Like when you come out to your teammates or was it was it a moment or does it just I don't know, does it just you just come in and one day and put your boots down and say, oh, I'm gay. I'm gay. 
<laughs> you know, pretty it, much. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's one of those things that me and Farah were talking about this before, and like, because we've known each other for years, and Farah's seen me have boyfriends, yeah. you know, girlfriends, she's seen it all. But I think it's quite interesting because I was the first ever England player to come out, right. but I wasn't, it, it's weird for me to say that because there was a lot of other teammates that were gay. So I feel like I've got that crown, oh, the first ever yeah. England gay footballer and one of the first in the world. But I know there was people in my team that were battling that. So when right. they were being asked that question, how does it feel having Leanne on your team? I always felt like it was a strange dynamic because there was about 70% yeah. of my teammates that, that identify yeah. as being LGBTQ+. Yeah. So it was a weird one because in the men's game, of, yeah. people get often, uh, often asked, oh, what would the men react like? I mean, yeah. my teammates, most of them were gay. So yeah. therefore it was non a non-thing. I realised the platform that I have, but one thing I will say, it became my definition. Mm. It was the only thing people wanted to talk about when I signed in Spain, when I signed for Juventus. Oh, Leanne the gay footballer. No, I'm yeah. Leanne the football, Leanne Sonnison the footballer that happens to be gay, not yeah. Leanne's gay. I said, yeah. you might as well copy and paste all the interviews that I've ever done. Yeah. Because I'm going to say the exact same thing. It's not like my gay story's changed. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's still the you same. Know, you know on that? Because obviously, like we spoke before about, I believe that the women's game, certainly when I joined the women's game, was heavily 90%, I'm going to put it out there, plus, mm -hmm. that was gay. Right? I said 70, was, but I think was, I was being, being you're kind. You're being kind, right? <laughs> because, and I say that because when I retired at my club, I retired at, there was probably one or two straight people within a squad of 23. So for me, that is telling you the percentage of gay people within the women's game is really high, right? So obviously you said you come into the game straight. So we come in, I've got boyfriends, we all did, we had boyfriends. And I believe through curios curiosity and the environment and the culture that we were in, we become curious about what is a lesbian. Because I remember, like, there were nights where the girls, the senior players, like, they're going, oh, we're going into town, G-A-Y, whatever it was, I can't remember. It's and I'm like, I'm going yeah. home to my boyfriend, right? And then you get to a point when you're, like, 80, it's like, oh, I might go and see what this G-A-Y is about, right? And you end up going. So do you think that kind of, like, allowed you to be, like, or explore experiment and then obviously then find yourself within that i think i was within always gay when i look back on myself i'm like you little you lesbian <laughs> <laughs> like literally like i look back on myself you know me when i was nine i had this little big she head she was I, had, like, <laughs> yeah. I just i mean i just feel like i just never really knew myself but then sometimes i do think you know when i had my boyfriend i loved him you know i didn't want him mm. to think he was the That's reason so cute. it's true though like i didn't <laughs> want him the, no i just want to know if, 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 if you felt safer because as I say, the percentage was really high. I and think I found myself more, though. Okay. I genuinely think it allowed me to be my, my true, authentic self. Wouldn't it just be wonderful if we could just all navigate the world and in a space where we feel so open and safe that you can, you know, be whoever you, be whoever you are, attracted to whoever you are, build relationships, community with whomever. And, like, isn't... I, I think it's it sounds labeled, lovely. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, you, become a, you become like, a label, and I was never yeah. going to accept myself as a label. Yeah. I am who I am. If I'm yeah. with a girl at the time, yeah. I'm obviously gay, I'm a lesbian. If I'm with a guy, I'm straight, and if I'm not, I'm single, right? Yeah. So it's pretty simple. That's how I see things, but I'm quite... I'm black and white with everything. Parents have a fear, right, because I've obviously coached at yeah. RTCs and ETCs, mm. which is the elite game. I've coached... At, the clubs I played for, under 16s, 14s, 12s, whatever. Parents are scared to allow their, their, their kid to play the women's game for that reason, that it's going to force them into an environment that is heavily gay and that potentially then their daughter will become gay, mm -hmm. right? So they are, and I've had parents say that to me. And how do I answer that when actually you're probably right? from the experiences I've had. That's I'm, what I've witnessed really in the game and it's what and I've witnessed. That's really, yeah, well, that's it's really right, interesting. That's what, well, I don't know because they just want... The, I don't know because they probably think if they go into a different environment or a different industry, a work line or whatever, yeah. they might not be. But why is it bad then? I'm just... I don't I know, know if it's good or bad. I, know, but I don't know if it's good or bad, but I can understand scared, their point. That means... I can understand their point. I can understand why they would feel that. So it goes back mm. to almost nature versus nurture is what you're saying as well, mm. yeah. to a certain degree. But this is great it's because everyone's spectrum. story is spectrum, different, though, isn't it? Isn't and it? I think goes back to what I was saying about putting people into boxes. Yeah. You know, we just want everyone to be accepted for whatever they want to be. If mm. one day someone wants to be gay, they can be gay. <laughs> someone day wants non-binary, let them do whatever they want to do. And I think we're all sitting here having these types of conversations because we're open to everything. You know, you mentioned it earlier. What was it you said? Yeah, you have this one statement that you say, love all. You were yes. talking, you say everybody all the time, love Joe. everybody. Everybody love everybody. And that would that is great that Joe's like yeah. that, but not everybody is like that. And yeah. you know, this brings some me people to... for some people it's not a choice though. You've got we've got to be really careful because I think of some of my friends, it's like there's no way they could have been anything but queer. 
There's no mm. way there could have been anything but trans. There's no way they could, you know, yeah. and, and, and that can be really hard for them in the sense that for some people it is a spectrum. Because I think the, the, the difficulty is of sort of saying, and I, I can hear what you're saying, Farah, but the difficulty is you'll hear this sometimes, is when you say like, oh, you, the environment or the choice or whatever, is you end up with conversion therapy, people being bullied, um, you know, like trying to kind of somehow pray away the gay or whatever, because saying it's a, it, it is a choice. And I, I think the thing there is sometimes people do make those choices and they should be respected and enabled to do so. But in other contexts, it's not a choice. And so that spectrum is the thing that we have to, we have to make sure that we like celebrate and give everyone the space to do that. Yeah. I think as well, this leads me on to allyship. We spoke about it earlier and I was, I was saying to Joe, you know, was it ever a conversation in your head today when you got asked to do this? Because yeah. you didn't want to do it based upon what people might think. Because I think, you know, five to 10 years ago, if a former male footballer yeah. took part in something like this, people would automatically assume they're yeah. gay yeah. or something like that. What, what was that? What was not the thought process? Reason, yeah. Not for that reason. Like, first of all, the right, the right, when it come across my email and I thought, right, okay, what is this? Read the thing, right, okay, that sounds cool. That's you a, saw I was on it, you're like, I'm yeah, definitely Yeah, I'm definitely, definitely. <laughs> as in, I'm in, I'm anything. Like you dodged it. <laughs> so I've gone, uh, but I thought, the, the main thing is, honestly, I thought, oh, I don't want to say something that offends someone and gets myself in trouble. Do you know what I mean? But I know my heart, you know, I, like you said, when we chat in, in the makeup room, you know, everybody, I've, to accept everybody, do you know what I mean? That's common decency. It overarches all of these things, homophobia, racism, it's common decency, in my opinion. But um, I wasn't, so I wasn't afraid of what, I don't care what people think of me. I think oh, it's, it's a good campaign, putting out positivity, I'll come in. The only thing I was worried about from a straight male's perspective is saying the wrong thing, upsetting one of you yeah, guys. You and, say that as a do you know what I mean? I, I feel that, I feel that. I'm not educated around LGBTQ. <clears throat> I've been with girls mm. in the past. I'm not educated around it. So even I, like, when I get asked to do this, I'm a bit like, oh, my God. Yeah, but I'm not. Even, I don't know I, the answers either. Yeah, but I'm you not probably, the, you people probably love understand when I say it's a, a gay more. superhero. Mm. Everyone <laughs> always thinks I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> because I was the first ever England player. They're like, yeah. asking me all these questions. Yeah, you do a lot like, of campaigns, so you, you join yeah. a lot of panels around yeah. LGBTQ. I don't, right? Yeah. So then to be asked to come on here as somebody that, has, as I say, have had gay relationships or whatever, I find it equally like you said to me. I'm like, oh, my God, what if I say something that offends one of us on here now? And I don't even know it's offensive because mm. for me it's not offensive. It's not offending. Or me. someone listening. So, more yeah. importantly, someone listening. But God, it's like, like just because, and as I said, because I'm not offended by it, doesn't mean to say the next person isn't. Mm. And that's what's really difficult. So although you want to be educated, and I would still love to be educated on it, so that I can say the right things around people and not get, not even get myself in trouble because that's my view of it. What do you help guys me think about that? this from mm. a fan's perspective and from people within the community? Because I, I, I've never heard Farrah or Joe say anything that makes me get my back up or anything like that. No. But, you know, if someone does, then what do you do in that situation? I'm not talking about in the stands. I'm talking about in a situation like this. If I said something that you might not like, what would you do I in that we situation? Have a chat. Because I think, because in this context, I, we know that each other's intention is good. Yeah. It's like you've just said, it's like the intention is good, it's about the common decency and all the rest of it. So, you know, like, this isn't about policing anybody's language. Mm. We're just trying to, like, figure out and have a chat. What? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, you have to police all my language. <laughs> <laughs> we just said that before, no, I don't know what I speak. <laughs> it's, not, it's not about policing anyone's language, it's about having, having these conversations. Mm. And actually, if there is something to say, do you know what, like, I don't mind because we're sat here and I can see your intention is good, but if you're somewhere else and someone overhears it, you might want to think about this. That's how I would approach it in this context. I think overall, though, guys, I think what we're saying as well <clears> is, <throat> for me, I think it's always important for people to be able to speak their mind, say how they feel, learn and become educated because I think, you know, that's the most important thing and that's why we're all here today. And hopefully people that are watching will be able to think, oh, I've learned something today mm. and take something from it. A question that always lingers with me, always has, always will, is why are LGBTQ plus men underrepresented in football? I sat down with Josh Cavello to talk about how we came out in 2021 and was the only current active player to do so. The women's game is something that inspired me to be who I am. And I said, why can't I do that in the men's game? Like, what's, what's the difference between us? Like, no one would ever look twice for anyone in the women's game that would come out and be themselves and, and say their sexuality or all their differences. So 
um, I wanted to change that and make that the same for the men. In my dark times when I wasn't out, that was a thing that motivated me. You know, seeing the LGBTQ plus athletes in the women's space was just absolutely phenomenal. It was the light at the end of the tunnel for me. I can understand 100% why someone hasn't come out. Look, in Australia, I'm very welcome, Tiana. I got taken in by arms open, and I don't know if that's going to be the case in the Premier League. Um, it disappoints me to say that, and it's it's devastating because it's like it's. What's that got to do with anything with football? But um, look, I, I I hope one day someone comes out in the Premier League. I really do because it's just something that, you know, it doesn't even need to be questioned and it doesn't even need to be anything to do with their skill. But it's the same borderline of going on the borderline of racism. You know, it's, it's for someone to take that next step and be brave enough to come out in that sense. And, you know... I'm talking to a lot of footballers at the moment that aren't out and that are in their own space and their own journey. So um, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing because it seems to be working and we're getting more and more footballers coming out. So um, I'm really happy and honoured to be doing that for people. Unfortunately, I do get death threats to this day. And if I open up my uh, request messages, there's, there's quite some disturbing messages in there. But look, when I'm walking in the street and I see a mum, a dad or an uncle stop me and say I've helped their daughter, their son come out and they feel like they have a place in this world because of my story. I don't know these people personally, but to hear that and the power that this is this video and my coming out story has had on, the, on people around the world is just absolutely phenomenal. So the next subject I want to talk to you about, Farah, I'm going to come to you with this one, is why do you think in our community, in the, in the women's football world, is it more accepted to be LGBTQ plus than the men's game? Why do you think that is? I think, as I said, I think it goes back many years that women, gay women back in the day, felt like it was a safe space for them to play football. And so they, you know, the, the female game then become a culture of acceptance of, of gay women. And, and the more that then come into it, it kind of got its reputation through that. Um, I, as I say, I think because of that, it then allowed you to feel comfortable within that environment to be who you want to be, whether that be straight or gay um, or, or, or whatever you choose to be. So I think it, it goes back many years, and I think then when you come into that environment and you see it and, and, it, and it looks normal, you, you know, we all, we all react to things that are normal, right? And so playing football and coming into the, the female game, what looked normal to me was two women being together because that's what I saw a lot of, more so than I did a female and a male. So I think maybe for those reasons, it's been more accepted than, than the men's game and the culture of the men's game from the eye and from an outsider looking in as, as a fan of the men's game the culture looks completely different. It's what about... do you think about that, Joe? Because obviously you've been in the men's changing room. What do you think were the barriers, you know, growing up? Because obviously when you're at West Ham mm. as a youth player, times have changed quite a lot in yeah. a good way since then. Yeah. But what do you think were the main barriers? Um, that's a good question. Uh, do you know, I just thought of something about... I think, first of all, I think it reflects society. And if you're a bunch of footballers, you know, you talked about, you know, there's a, spec a spectrum. There'll be masculine men, there'll be feminine men, there'll be masculine women, feminine women, and I think football attracts predominantly really masculine men that like to, you know, it's, it's war, effectively. What to you? I know. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, no, it, trust me. It, 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 only, in order to fit in football as um, well. Is there a bit of that? That's may, may, possibly, possibly, but may, you're right. Maybe in my life, sport is where I, I exercise that, whether it be football, boxing, anything, the competitiveness. Um... But going back now, I remember at West Ham, I was, you might not believe this, but I was actually, uh, <laughs> I was, um, it was something in the newspaper where I was one of the pinups. And I got, I, got, I, got abuse, I got dog's abuse for it from the lads, you know, and I was like, you know, it didn't bother me. Do you know what I mean? But it was just that culture. But I can now put in myself in the shoes, if there was guys in the dressing room who were gay, it would have made them feel uncomfortable listening to that. Listening to that. Because they Cause might be sitting there laughing. Yeah. But yeah. That's what I'm saying. Because yeah. there was a little yeah. bit of it. There was a little bit of yeah. derogatory about yeah. it. So yeah. now we've had this conversation, you know, now you understand a little bit there. But going back to your question um, about is it welcoming, it, I, I think it, it certainly wasn't 20 years ago. I think it probably is now. We've come, you know, Thomas Hitzelsberger and people like have, have, have come out as gay and, and Josh and, and everyone. And one thing they did say was, their teammates were one of the best people for them, so most welcome. Because I think, I think foot, as a football team, you come from all. I play with African players, South American players, different religions, different backgrounds, but you come together as a team, mm. and that's your, that's your, you know, if if one of you's hurting, you're all hurting. So actually, footballers are actually, believe it or not, quite worldly in that way because we're not. 
in, we don't live in our own, you know, we got, like I said, blessed to go around the world and meet different people. So I think now it's actually set up so well for, for any player that feels that they, they, they can come out. And, and, you know, when it's your team, it's your team. And, it's, and I think players will be, they'll be, they'll be, how they deal with it, I don't know. You but I think it'll that. be positive. Hitzelsberger, so he said that after, didn't he? Because he didn't yeah. come out whilst mm. playing, yeah. right? Mm. And obviously, the, the Rio Ferdinand documentary, he, he mentions within that mm. that he felt that he could be the scapegoat for performances, results, mm. whatever, if he was to come out during his career as a player, right? So even though players now are probably more acceptant because they're more educated, mm. do you think that that would have the same effect now as a player probably feeling as if if they were to come out and results started to, to think or the, 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 the culture within the group started to change the dynamic, they would be the... Do you know, what do you think? That's, you know a, good, I mean? I don't that's know. a good point. I, I don't, me personally, I don't think... I'd like to think we've moved on from the fact that people will blame a player because they're gay if they miss a chance mm. and those types of things. But there are some people, as we see every single week, racist abuse, homophobic that's abuse. That's what I mean. You people think back to the racism that. that England yeah. players got for missing penalties. It wasn't, yeah. They, they didn't lose us the Euros, so I'm saying, mm. if you was a gay... It just what gives you, people... Think, it Joe? just gives you that yeah, extra, I, right, to I say can, it. I can see why... I can see why that, but not... So again, I know it. I overarch it with the common decency. I think as a fo- we live in a strange world, and I think footballers, anything can happen at a football club, and fans will use it to that's the, to that's the point I'm to to, yeah. to dig players out. And if it was homophobia or racism, I think there's a like again that twelfth man. He'll be online saying that stuff. You know that that guy. You know. It's interesting you say this yeah. year because after the Brentford game where we drew. Yeah. We were robbed, actually, but yeah. we drew. And, <laughs> and then the, uh, the no Chelsea, the, the, Man, the Man City game. Yeah. On Arsenal's Twitter account that yeah. week, yeah. my group, yeah. the Gay Gooners, were blamed. Really? For the loss. We lost because oh, Arsenal supported the, the that, gays, yeah, right? See, that's the point. So that I mean, it's pathetic. Back, 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 back. I'm sorry, it's, it's totally pathetic. It's an excuse to blame, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. That's going to the point about saying if a player came out, that's the kind of... I was going to use a rude word then, but yeah, Joby didn't. It, 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 it's it's wrong, but unfortunately, there's still that attitude yeah. um, out there. It's interesting. I'm listening to the conversation, and I'm think because I'm often asked about a player coming out. Mm. I worked in an industry, the chemical industry, for wow. for a number of years, and it was a bit like football. Very, you know, you, yeah. you, you certainly would not come out because the environment, and the sales, and the yeah. the manufacturing thing, and all of it. And it's very difficult because you have to spend your life not being who you are. Yeah, yeah, and putting on that show all mm. the time. So if you're a gay player in the dressing room, it's tough because mm. you're not ready to come out. And that coming out helps because coming out, you know, I've, I was actually married for 12 years. Mm. Um, I had a son. I still have a son, a Liverpool fan, but we'll yeah. forgive him for that. <laughs> um, but there's that expectation yeah. that you're, you're going to let people down. So I, mm. I was trying to please everybody else all of the time and it got to the point where I thought what's the point we discussed homophobic abuse from the pitch and in the stands but it's the form of online abuse that's the worst EE Hope United is a team of elite footballers from across the home nations dedicated to combating online hate in all its forms Joe you're an ambassador for Hope United can you tell us a little bit about the campaign please we're in an era where we've got social media it's so new for us as human beings it's ability to to communicate and to affect more than people. Usually we'd have a chat, we might be sitting at a pub or a cafe and we could be having a chat. You think about online, it's thousands and millions of people you can affect. So you reach the positivity and you can reach with a negativity. More positivity, you know, let, you know call people out if they're being, on, being a bit um, horrible online, you know, yeah. things like this. And, and generally just, just being a good, good campaign that we should all get behind. And bring the positivity. Amazing. Everybody, I love everybody, Leanne. Absolutely. You know my mantra. I do, and I love that about <laughs> you, Joe. And Farah, you're an ambassador for Hope United as well. We've got some incredible blockbuster names, Lucy Bronze, Rio Ferdinand, to name a few. Tell us a bit why this is so important to you. No, I think it's what, what Joe mentions there. I think, you know, when you see the, the high calibre of players, male and female, that are behind the campaign... I think it gives people hope. I think that the, the, it's, in the, it's in the name, isn't it? That the, the hope that if you are getting abused online, look, we've all suffered it. I think they've also suffered it, so they can relate to it. And I, look, I think, as, as Joe mentioned, it, it's a, fan, a fantastic campaign for people to get behind. It's a great initiative, and, it, and it's certainly growing. Well, guys, I've got another stat for you. You'd be happy to know. According to a recent UK Gov survey, a third of fans, 33%, 
felt that LGBTQ plus supporters were made to feel welcoming and accepted at matches. 55% wanted their team to increase its support for LGBTQ plus rights for players. Carl, as a member of Arsenal's LGBTQ plus fan group, what does the club do to combat homophobic abuse? Oh, a huge amount. We, I, I basically talk to the club every day about <laughs> all sorts of uh, different issues around um, the gay gooners. Um, they're so supportive and genuinely want to make the, the mantra is Arsenal for everyone. And, and I genuinely believe that that's what the club uh, want. You see visibility uh, at the stadium, more visibility uh, as each season uh, goes by. We're seen as part of the family um, at Arsenal, an important part of the family. We've had some members of the, the, the women's team that have been in the Emirates and seen the Gay Gooners banner up in the stadium and felt, I'm welcome here. This, this, is a club, this is a club for me. So it's not just us as an isolated group, it's about the entire Arsenal family coming together. Um, we're as much against uh, racism and anti-Semitism and misogyny as any other group. And, you know, we pride ourselves in being diverse and inclusive. Great. Now on to the biggest rivals, the Proud Lily Whites. What are you guys doing to combat the homophobia? Well, I mean, I'll echo what Carl just said. We work really, really closely with the club, um, but we also sort of act as a critical friend. So, you know, we make sure that we're almost like an internal consultancy. We work with them, like, you know, we've done uh, training with staff, training with stewards. We've worked with, with, um, with young people that are on coaching courses via the Tottenham Hotspur Foundation and also kind of do events. And we've got this wonderful new stadium now, so it can turn into a big rainbow when we need it to. Especially and Lady so Gaga's there. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And Beyonce as well coming I know, up. I can't, can't wait. wait. Um, and so I think what's really important is that we work together and it's very much a case of, you know, when we started the Proud Lily Whites, it was something that the club were thinking about at the same time as the fans. Because the club are like, we need to do more for our LGBTQ plus fans. But actually it's important, and Carl will tell you this, it's important for this work to be fan-led, because then it's authentic. For the, for the groups that try and do it, um, where the club tries to, to start something, it never works. So Chris, how does someone become an active ally? So for those that are listening, how do people become an yeah, active ally? So, you know, we, at the, the Proud Lily Whites, like, we've got a, a membership and you can be, you know, it's most, it's for LGBTQ plus Spurs fans, but also for our allies. And we've also got a thing, a thing that we started about 18 months ago. We call it Proud Lily Whites Proud Champions. And we've got members from group, Spurs fan groups all over the country and all over the world and friendly, like, podcasts and other, another um, kind of um, broadcasts, if you like, to sort of say, OK, we're allies to the Proud Lily Whites, so we're going to amplify campaigns for the groups that are in different parts of the world. If you go... I went to New York, for example, at the back end of last year. Um, I know that New York Spurs are Proud Lily Whites proud champions. I went to New York. I watched two games with New York Spurs. And I knew, because they'd signed up to this thing, that it would be a safe place for me to go and watch the game. And we say that to our members. Here are the Proud Champions. This comes to my last question, and I'll come to you first, Joe. Where do you see society in 10 years and how much more mm -hmm. needs to be done and how much more inclusivity do you foresee happening? I genuinely think we're on the, the right path. I think it's great what these guys are doing. Um, I, wish, I wish everyone who wants to go and watch a football, ma football match anywhere in the country can go and have a great time and feel safe and enjoy themselves because football's for everyone. Absolutely. And Farah? Be honest. Um, no, I am. I, I mean, I, I would expect change. So there'll, there'll be growth, there'll be development within that, there'll be education. But I think in terms of the education, I think there definitely needs to be more. So if we want to make changes, and we spoke before, I think it's great that we have all these initiatives and they are great. I played 23 and a half years within the women's game. I didn't have one educational piece around racism, yet every one month, one day in the season, I would wear a kick it out shirt. Didn't understand. I, I knew I was representing, you know, what, what it was, but I didn't understand. I was never educated around it. If we are to to make any progress in, in, within these ten years, along with all these initiatives, has to come education. There has to be people on the ground actually going out and trying to educate people to to, to make things better. That's just my personal opinion. And Sorry Chris, if I've offended you guys. <laughs> you're <laughs> you're, you're, you're bang Chris, I'm going to come to you you're because I want to leave the Guna because they're top of the table oh. as first. Oh, yeah, so oh, I'm going to come, come to you. Coming up. <laughs> Go, go I'm going to come to you talking of, talk of fighting talk. <laughs> I, I think, just to echo what Joe said earlier, it's like, I've loved football all my life, right? That feeling you get when the ball's flying through the air and about to hit the back of the net, and as a fan, everyone stands up at the same time. 
it's like you can't replicate that anywhere. And it's absolutely magic. And so that has to be for everybody. It saddens me so much where you hear some LGBTQ plus folks saying, you know, I was about to come out and it, it didn't feel like it was for me. It's like, I don't want to deny that to anybody. So if anything like that we could be doing here, that we're doing as fan groups, that, you know, the education piece that you're talking about, like, because you have to do it in all different levels, whether it's to players, you know, to the fans, to staff, etc. Let's just, let's keep doing that. And, you know, just to go with, with the, the hope theme, I saw it as a guy called Brian Stevenson, who's a civil rights activist in America. His view is that... Um, Hope is the enemy of injustice, and that's what we've got to, kind of got to keep on. Amazing. Thanks, Chris. And last but not least, Carl? I think for the next 10 years, it's, it's a continuation of what we've been doing with, with the constant messaging. And to, to Farrell's point about the education, I think it's, it's, it's very important. But that education has to start early, but it has to extend through, through the clubs as well. I think the, the mantra that, that we've had in the, with Arsenal over the last year or so is pride every day. We all love football. We're all football fans at the end of the day. And that's why I want us to be in 10 years' time is, you know, happy family of football supporters who give the West Ham fans a hard time and the Spurs fans a hard time. That's part of the joy of football. Glad and we should never, Chelsea. and we should never, <laughs> we should never lose that. Never lose that. Amazing. Well, unfortunately, guys, I have to say that's it from us. But thank you to everyone watching at home. Hope United everyone's games. Thank you to Mr. Joe Cole, Farrah Williams, Cole Fern and Chris Porras. Thanks for watching at home and have a wonderful day. For more information on the Hope United campaign, head to eehopeunited.co.uk.